What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet, your place for all things Elder Scrolls. Today I've got a bit of a different video for you that I thought would be fun, diving deep into the 10 playable races of the Elder Scrolls games to help you decide which one you'd best embody from a role-playing perspective. Now of course none of you are sporting a fur-covered tail or have horned eyebrows or scaled skin, but that doesn't stop us from examining the most well-known traits, ideas and philosophies found in each province of Tamriel and seeing which of Tamriel Tamriel's inhabitants sound most like you. Also keep in mind that while all 10 playable races can go against the crowd, such as an orc leaving his clan to become a mage in Cyrodiil, we'll be going with the most classic, traditional, mainstream interpretations of each culture. As you may expect, there's no 100% accurate way of lining each of you up with one of the 10 races, with no crossover with any of the other 9, however I think after hearing all the considerations, you'll have a pretty good idea of where you may fit in best when it comes to roleplaying. Whatever conclusions you come to, make sure to let us know in the comments which race you think suits you the most. If you enjoy the video, please do consider hitting that like button and subscribing if you want to get more Elder Scrolls goodness in your life. Now as Hadvar says when you step off the back of the wagon in Helgen, who are you? Let's kick things off with the Argonians of Black Marsh. Do you consider yourself a bit different from the rest? You may feel at home amongst others similar to you, but to most of the world outside of your comfort zone, perhaps you're somewhat of an outsider and often misunderstood. Well, if this sounds like you, you might be most similar to an Argonian. Argonians are considered to be the most misunderstood, unfairly vilified people of all the sentient races throughout Tamriel's history. Their unique cultural expressions, vastly different biology and alien manner make them hard to trust and relate to in many provinces outside of their homeland. Their language, Gel, is said to be incredibly difficult to learn, and incorporates many unique noises, including hisses, relying a lot on the specific biology of Argonian throats, which other races simply do not possess to make certain sounds. On top of this, they can use metaphors quite heavy-handedly and use subtle body movements to communicate much of the nuance of what they're trying to say. Do you also find yourself communicating with those closest to you in a very unique way? Whether it's how you make jokes or express yourself, if you know that any strangers passing by hearing the same words wouldn't fully get what you mean, then you can probably relate. That said, while Argonians are often considered very different from the rest, they can be equally distrusting of outsiders at times and are quite reserved in the presence of those they do not know. Even Argonians not born in Black Marsh end up being viewed as too distanced to relate to those born of the swamps. On the flip side, Argonians are known to fight to the death to protect a friend and are incredibly loyal to those they do know. Argonians of Black Marsh are also tied together through a common religion and way of life, involving their veneration of the ancient sentient histories who created them. So if you've always felt one with nature, which Argonians quite literally are, then this race may be the right fit. The Argonian understanding of spirituality, the cycle of life and death, and other related matters also derives from the Hist, leading to ways of thinking not too different to certain religious beliefs in our own world. What I'm talking about are some parallels to Buddhism. Argonians are very focused on living in the present, and actually believe in a kind of reincarnation. Death is not the end, but an opportunity for a new beginning a new cycle. Because Argonians believe that after they die, they will eventually return to the world as a new Argonian, most of them see hateful grudges as futile. Their desire to focus on the now helps them avoid making petty disputes last for long, and ultimately they believe that they are all connected to the Hist, and therefore to hate someone else is to hate oneself. Perhaps you share similar spiritual attitudes. Their language we spoke of earlier, gel, is also a great reflection of just how focused on the present Argonians really are. It only has present tense verbs, simply excluding verbs for past and future tense. So to see yourself as similar to an Argonian, you'd want to be the kind of person who lives in the present and cares about what's happening right now. If you've got your head constantly reminiscing about better times, or constantly projecting yourself into future situations that haven't even happened, then you probably wouldn't fit in too well in Black Marsh. The idea of moving on is even reflected in the architecture of Argonian society. Ancient Argonians built long-lasting Xanmir structures and had a different outlook on life. 
Their religion focused heavily on Sithis and saw him as a destroyer. They feared destruction and the change that comes with it. In more modern times since then, Argonians have come to see Sithis as more of a force of change and believe nothing is more foolish than to deny change. The new way of Argonian thinking became about overcoming the fear of death and forgetting and the pain caused by holding on too tightly to that which has come to pass. If you're the kind of person who loves to take photos everywhere you go or is extremely sentimental about trinkets, then this doesn't sound like a philosophy you'd want to live by. Nowadays, Argonians build their structures from materials such as mud and reeds, and these dwellings are intended to be temporary and aligned with their ideology of embracing impermanence. Another very unique aspect of Argonian life is their relation to genders. Genders have been referred to as life phases for Argonians, and the in-game description from Morrowind states that the female life phase is highly intelligent and gifted in the magical arts. The more aggressive male phase has the traits of the hunter, stealth, speed, and agility. This phrase, life phases, makes it sound like that perhaps throughout the years, Argonians can switch between male and female. There are other sources that point towards this in the lore, and what we know for sure is that it can be a choice which involves communing with the Hist and undergoing a transformation ceremony. Overall, if gender fluidity is important to you, perhaps you may find a connection with Argonians here, or you may simply lack the idea of being able to change back and forth over time to explore many different life experiences without setting your identity in stone for too long. The description of the male life phase brings up the physical competency that all Argonians share in the sense that their abilities are far different to that of other races. Argonians are known to be highly gifted in a variety of physical skills such as stealth and agility. Their ability to stay hidden across a variety of environments has given them great potential to become experts in guerrilla warfare and highly prized assassins. They're also excellent swimmers with the ability to breathe underwater. They also have an innate immunity to poison and disease. If you are a trained or natural born swimmer who never gets sick or always found yourself to be agile on your feet, then tick off another box for representing an Argonian. Next up, we have the Bretons of High Rock, a race created from the fusion of both elves and men. They are not as brawny as the Nords to their east, nor are they as naturally proficient in magic use as the High Elves of the Somerset Isles. Instead, they find themselves somewhere in between, having far more natural talent for arcane matters than other races of men, while still boasting impressive warriors and knights who constantly strive for glory. The Bretons are an optimistic people, in the sense that they truly believe they have the chance to further their standing in life by taking action, and in many ways this is true. They have a saying, find a new hill, become a king, which reflects much of their culture perfectly. As a Breton, you thrive on tales of heroism. Ambitious youths dream of rising to higher stations in life as they prove themselves to be capable and honorable individuals. There is somewhat of an obsession for questing, with many Bretons always seeking to perform good deeds in an attempt to reach a noble status. In many ways, this can give the people of High Rock an altruistic streak, although in reality their stellar service is usually done with selfish reasons in mind. One has to ask themselves, if a lowly beggar decides to do me a great service on my journey through High Rock, is it because they care to help, or is it a desperate attempt at raising one's status? Already, you can probably start knowing if you'd make a good Breton or not if I threw you into High Rock. Would you be thriving in an environment where you can actually gain respect and improve your life for succeeding in heroic aspirations? Not only your life, but that of your descendants too. Are you a very courageous and ambitious person with a natural talent for both intellectual and physical pursuits, yet a true master of neither? And do you also aim to bring about positive change, not only to make the world a better place, but also because of the sense of identity or respect it may bring you? Sounds like a textbook Breton to me. However, it is said that many gallant acts are often done in vain, so you'd probably want to be the type of person who enjoys chivalry in order to keep pushing to consistently work at increasing your reputation. No one would choose to be a Breton in order to stay part of the impoverished lower classes. The whole appeal would be to begin to climb your way up the social ladder, or at least to get into the middle rungs. While this honourable Breton identity helps bind the people of High Rock together, they are also a very fractured bunch, both politically, socially, and geographically. As mentioned, there are the different classes of societal separation. The first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire describes the Bretons as being divided into a poor middle class and destitute peasantry, a magical elite separate from their squalor, and an often incoherent jumble of nobility and ruling families above them all. Of course, there's sure to be more nuance than that, 
that, particularly when you consider merchants of all different levels of success, but the significant thing here is that Bretons can still be lifted into the graces of the upper class to achieve the life and status of a noble even if they're born a meagre farmhand. To be a Breton, you're also likely to fit in as a competitive person, as well as being someone who believes that competition is healthy and necessary for a successful society. Does this sound like you? Bretons have fought against Red Guards, Orcs, and defended against multiple invasions over the centuries, but they have also earned much of their battle experience by fighting each other. The power centers of High Rock have changed over the years, and much like the status climbing actions of the people, cities have gone from small settlements to powerful kingdoms, forging age old rivalries and many new kings. This helps keep things somewhat decentralized, as a sole leader does not make decisions for the entire province. Without a central point of command, there's been a lot of infighting over the years, but arguably this has only made them stronger and more experienced. Since the Dereni Elves lost their grasp on the province, the hundreds of fiefdoms left to squabble were eventually consolidated into a handful of kingdoms, with more unity than ever before achieved after the warp in the west. Other things of note would be that Breton society actually has a solid focus on education, and High Rock is actually known for producing some of the best spies. Spies and even Nightblades are often just as, if not more useful than Breton warriors. There is also a strong focus on commerce. Instead of trying to become a heroic knight, many Bretons turn to being a merchant, like our good friend Bellathor in Whiterun. Perhaps you like the idea of living in medieval England or France, but instead of risking your blood in battle, you'd rather put your coin on the line or get involved in subterfuge. And now we arrive at the Dark Elves, also known as the Dunmar, hailing from one of if not the most interesting province of Tamriel, Morrowind. Are you the kind of person who is intimately connected with your family members, or whoever you consider your clan in life to be? Are they the most important thing to you, so much so that after death you'd be willing to go through some unpleasant pain to be brought back to the mortal plane to help other family members with troubles they're facing? Perhaps Dark Elves are the race for you. Many Dark Elf customs are considered quite bizarre by outsiders. These misunderstood elves claim to despise necromancy, and yet to other races it seems as if they participate in exactly that when they summon their ancestors. To a Dark Elf, family is extremely important. They are a highly clan-focused group of people, and unlike the High Elves, who only worship their most powerful ancestors, aka the Aedra, Dark Elves worship all of their ancestors, including their immediate family members who have since passed. Dunmer houses are said to have a family shrine, where family artifacts are venerated along with ancestors themselves. Dunma can give updates to ancestral spirits on what has been happening, and even seek advice or be blessed from beyond the grave. Bringing a spirit back into the mortal world is somewhat of an emergency option for the Dunma, and is considered to be a painful experience. The pain spirits endure to be manipulated or summoned after death is one of many reasons why necromancy is frowned upon in many places around Tamriel. But in Dark Elf culture where this is not considered necromancy, their ancestor would willingly enter the world in spirit form if they were needed. In the Elder Scrolls lore, a Dark Elf is also viewed as a jack of all trades when it comes to skills. There are still master wizards, unnaturally gifted assassins, and melee specialists, but overall the Dunma have been known to show a balanced integration of skills on the battlefield. A single Dunma could be a proficient destruction mage, while also knowing how to swing a sword and to let fly an arrow with respectable accuracy. If you've got quite a balanced skill set that serves you well in life, then this is something you have in common with Dark Elves. A highly significant facet of Dark Elf philosophy we just have to talk about is their unconventional approach to personal growth and enlightenment. You see, unlike other elves who view Lorcan as a trickster to be despised, the three good Daedra taught the Dark Elves that Lorcan created the mortal realm as a testing ground for transcendence. So instead of moping about their existence like the High Elves, wishing they had not fallen from a higher spiritual plane, the Dunma see the world and mortality as a challenge to overcome. Due to this, powering through adversity is well embedded in Dark Elf attitudes, and this could definitely be reflected in the mindsets of many people watching this video. If you're the kind of person who sees the tough parts of life as challenges allowing growth, then that's another thing that might have you feeling at home in Morrowind. So long as you can handle the hot climate and enjoy what their highly unique environment has to offer. A final thing worth noting is that the Dark Elves are undoubtedly a highly spiritual and religious society. They had the Tribunal, three living gods ruling them for thousands of years, and throughout history have been shown to be staunch Daedra worshippers. Spiritual and or religious matters will need to play a significant role in your daily life if you're a Dark Elf. 
Next, we turn our gaze to the Southwest. If you believe you're better than everyone else and think you've got some clear-cut reasons that prove it, at least to yourself, then you might just be the perfect candidate for being born in the Somerset Isles. Here live the Ultima, or High Elves, possessing one of the most elitist cultures in the Elder Scrolls universe. High Elf society is similar to the Bretons in that there are different classes, however what sets them apart is that in the Somerset Isles, you're born into a caste and don't have the same social mobility to climb ranks and achieve a higher status. The Ultima believe in the purity of certain bloodlines and will only marry within them in the higher echelons of society. However, High Elves don't just have strong opinions about who is superior to someone else within their own society, they also think that they as a collective are the best, not just culturally as is seen through their frequently snobbish attitudes, but also biologically. High Elves are the tallest race, giving them slightly longer legs for covering more ground and slightly longer reach as they swing their weapons. They're not the strongest race, but are still definitely not weak, and they can make competent warriors regardless. However, their main area of expertise involves all things arcane. High Elves are incredibly gifted when it comes to magic and are known to be quite intelligent. In the lore, High Elves have been shown to be weaker to magic than other races as well, so if your main strength in life is a double-edged sword that sometimes comes back to bite you, that's something you have in common with the Ultma. On top of this, the High Elves long lifespan is said to be the longest on average out of all the other races, with living for hundreds of years being normal. As is the case with other races, magic can allow them to live even longer on top of this. If you think about it, High Elves' long lifespan gives them extra time that other races simply don't have to hone their already boosted magic skills and any other skill or hobby they choose. That said, their long lives have not been enough to have them conquer all of Tamriel, at least not yet, and throughout the eras they've still struggled in many battles against the races of men. One could say that they are willing to play the long game and plan ahead. They are willing to use their time to contemplate the most strategic way to dominate while delaying gratification and biding their time until they can take action and get what they want. High Elves also worship their strongest ancestors, the Aedra, who they believe they are descended from. Some Ultima wish to be free from mortality and return to this godlike state, so if you're the kind of person longing for the good old days, then these Elves might best represent you. This is very different to the Dunmer's worship of more immediate ancestors such as grandparents. Ultima only see the most powerful spirits as worthy of veneration. It seems this ideology is where their elitist views are derived from, as they separate levels of worthiness all the way down from the gods to the priests, nobles, and to the lower classes in their society. If you also obsess over your ancestry, but only the coolest or most successful elements of it, then perhaps you'd make a good high elf. I'm talking about all of the people listening who are incredibly proud of tracing their lineage back to the Spartans, Roman Emperors, Vikings, or any other group of people that are idolized in modern culture while ignoring all their other farmer ancestors in between. And now we come to a race that has had perhaps the largest impact on the Elder Scrolls timeline, the Imperials. The Imperials are best known for the Empire itself and the ideals it tends to embody. When people think of the Imperials, they often think of a cosmopolitan culture and of the land of Cyrodiil, a place where every race is said to be welcome and can carve out a good life for themselves, at least compared to other provinces. There are Argonian and Khajiit stewards working in the castle, and even a Dunma Count of Chadenhall who you can meet in Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. However, do keep in mind that the overwhelming majority of people with power in Cyrodiil are still Imperials. The main difference is that, as a whole, Imperials tend to have a much less xenophobic culture culture when compared to many other provinces in Tamriel. It's worth pointing out that while the Imperials can sound like a massive force of good in the world, the main faction that represents them, the Empire, are far from being the good guys. The Empire promotes cosmopolitan ideals, but are quite colonialist in the sense that throughout history they have pushed their own culture into other provinces, subjugating the local people and conquering their lands. A soldier of the Empire may believe they bring prosperity to other lands, and in some ways they do bring some benefits, but ultimately they have assumed control by force many times and by negotiating in ways that serve them more than the province they're reaching their fingers into. It is unsurprising that many believe the Empire does more harm than good, while others support it with all their heart. As much as we shouldn't assume that every member of the Imperial race believes that the actions of the Empire are justified and it's wise not to completely conflate the two, I think there's more chance of you fitting in with the Imperials if you're generally pro-Empire when it comes to governance in Tamriel. 
That all said, I still think you can tick some Imperial boxes if you see the advantage that interacting with other cultures can bring. Imperial citizens would appreciate benefits like their trade networks spread across multiple provinces that allow all involved to gain from sharing materials and resources, certain technologies, unique ingredients, food supplies, trinkets, and so on. If you're an Imperial, then you're likely someone who understands that diplomacy is wielded as a weapon and a shield. It allows for shrewd negotiating in your favor and builds alliances that can often proactively prevent uprisings against you. Imperials are also known to be quite courteous and conduct themselves with an air of civility and tend to be more well-mannered than the men of other provinces, such as the Nords of Skyrim. To prove a point, consider that even certain vampire orders of Cyrodiil position themselves as civilized and almost regal. As we've mentioned, Imperials are a race that focuses on commerce. Many merchants and traders thrive in an Imperial-influenced environment, and Imperials often make for sensational salespeople, being known to have naturally gifted silver tongues and diplomatic inclinations. If you're quite charismatic, good at making friends, and especially talented at striking great deals, be it in your personal or professional life, then this might be the race for you. Imperials are also considered to be quite organized. Their culture is one that promotes and rewards discipline, so if you don't like to just rush in and you think the best way to tackle a problem is with diligent practice and formal training before taking action, then this could be the race most like you. Have you got a sweet tooth? If you're anything like me and you can't understand people who don't enjoy smashing a whole block of family chocolate in one go, then perhaps you'd fit in well in Elsewhere. The Khajiit of Elsewhere farm and consume more moon sugar than anywhere else in Tamriel. Moon sugar is a staple in Khajiit cuisine, used on all kinds of foods from sugar meats to candies, puddings, and cakes. The tolerance they've built to this substance goes beyond the other races of Tamriel, who could actually find the amount of moon sugar intake consumed by Khajiit to be fatal. Moon sugar can also be refined into a powerful narcotic substance known as skooma, which can be highly addictive and lead to severe mental deterioration. Khajiit smugglers who bring skooma to other provinces where it is illegal have earned the catfolk a bad reputation far and wide, though there's other reasons aside from skooma responsible for that. You see, Khajiit also have a reputation for thievery, due not only to some aspects of their mythology and worship, but also because of their most standout physical capabilities. Khajiit take on a feline appearance with the talents to match. They are highly acrobatic, good climbers, and also quite intelligent. Just like cats, they are well suited to scaling walls with ease, using their nimble limbs and even their tail to stay balanced as they run across the top silently and avoid detection. But just because somebody has the skills to steal or hide doesn't mean they should be labeled as a thief. But what makes matters worse for the Khajiit is that two of the gods they revere are involved with thievery. There's Bandar, a bandit trickster god whose cunning nature is said to help the Khajiit outplay their enemies, and who could forget Rajin, also a trickster and a legendary thief god who was once immortal but achieved apotheosis. So good a thief he was that in his mortal form, he stole the ring of Khajiiti from Mafala while making love to her after successfully seducing her, and is said to have taken the ebony blade as he left. He also stole the Ogma Infinium from Hermaeus Mora, and even stole a tattoo from the neck of a sleeping Empress Kintyra. With Khajiit being known to follow such gods, you can see how other cultures could find them somewhat hard to trust. If you've always been a fan of thieves, or even find yourself respecting and admiring them in criminal heist type films, or you're a self-admitted kleptomaniac, then living as one of the cat folk might be your style. Khajiit also come in many breeds, and the form they take on depends on the current phase of the moons when they're born. There are Khajiit ranging from small house cat-like beings known as Alfiq, as well as mammoth saber cat types known as Sench Rat. Of course, diving into all 17 breeds to figure out which one suits you the most would take more time than we have with this video. However, the take home message is that in Khajiit society, the positioning of celestial objects quite literally determines their biology. Khajiit society venerates the moons. So I'd say that if you're the kind of person who is really interested in astrology or star signs, which are known to have real effects in the Elder Scrolls universe, then you'd probably fit in well in elsewhere. You'd also make a good Khajiit if you're highly interested in or talented when it comes to martial arts. The Khajiit take naturally to unarmed combat, using their claws and any number of different martial arts styles to defeat their opponents. Known as claw dancers, these martial arts not only help Khajiit to defend themselves or attack opponents, but also function as a form of lyrical meditation. The Khajiit are also quite decorative. They enjoy wearing bright colored clothes and adorning themselves in all kinds of flamboyant and fashionable items. 
To make a point, even their armor, which is almost always light due to the hot, sandy terrain of the deserts, is frequently mistaken for being stylish clothing. They enjoy wearing jewelry and even displaying their cultural ties with special tattoos. Another interesting thing about the Khajiit is their pantheon, where other cultures have the Aedra and the Daedra, the Khajiit simply have spirits, which includes deities from all kinds of classifications. They are not restricted to one of two categories. Khajiit can worship Daedric princes like Azul Zora and Boethia, who they call Boethra, as well as Aedra such as Kanathi and Alkosh, who is Akatosh. To me, this indicates that Khajiit are not quick to attach a label with certain connotations to everything, nor box certain things into a particular category. Much like a cat left free to wander the city, the Khajiit allow themselves a way of thinking that is less constrained than many other cultures in the Elder Scrolls. If your brain works in a similar way, then perhaps you'd feel at home covered in fur with a tail in the south of Tamriel. If you'd be happy to spend many of your nights in the company of others, drinking yourself silly with mead and listening or even playing traditional northern tunes, then perhaps you'd fit in amongst the children of the sky, the Nords. However, while the people of Skyrim have a fondness for intoxication and good music, you're also going to want to be someone who can hold their own. Being what is essentially a fantasy viking comes at a cost, and it is a price you must always be willing to pay. You see, Nordic culture has a significant focus on honor, and to be a Nord, you must be tough. You must be someone who would never shy away from a brawl, and in the right circumstances would even fight to the death to defend their reputation. Nords have a deep respect for the legacy of their ancestors who did great things before them, and aim to live a life that any Nord would be proud of. In fact, not only will you achieve acceptance in society by avoiding cowardly traits, but it's also your ticket into the Nord's afterlife, Sovngarde. Nords who lived honorable lives, or died fighting valiantly in battle, are able to reach this afterlife, and if they've really proven themselves, then they may even be granted entry into Sovngarde's Hall of Valor. Here they may feast and drink in merriment for eternity alongside the most prestigious Nords who have left their mark upon the timeline. There is a Nord saying which goes like this, a Nord is judged not by the manner in which he lived, but the manner in which he died. If you've got guts and heart, then you might make a good Nord, but if you're easily intimidated or prefer to avoid confrontation, then this probably isn't a race you share strong similarities with. I'd also say if you have a background steeped in some kind of history that you really love and want to protect, be it a strong connection to more modern history or perhaps ancient, then you might share some of the honor-bound and heritage-loving traits that make the Nords such a proud group of people. For Nord men, to achieve true citizenship, they are said to spend weeks of their youth in the snow-covered mountains during the dead of winter, where they must slay an ice wraith. Being a Nord of Skyrim will also make a lot of sense if you just don't feel the cold, perhaps even like it. A fondness for the simple life would also serve you well. You'd benefit from being the kind of person who spends the day working hard, so that after you can unwind by drinking hard and singing hard too. Nords tend to appreciate the outdoors. If you're someone who enjoys hiking, particularly in mountainous terrain, then the Nord life is for you. Nords also have a reputation for being good sailors, so if you like being out at sea, then that's an extra area where you could fit in. Another thing would be a strong tendency towards superstition. In fact, life would be much easier if you actually enjoyed legends and folktales, otherwise all of the practices and fables around you, such as the story of the pale lady wandering the northern marches in search for her lost daughter, would likely drive you mad after a while. Nords are also highly suspicious of elves, and will often blame murders in the wilderness, theft or destruction of crops on the highly elusive underground race, the Corrupted Falma. Some evidence suggests the Falma are sometimes responsible, but a destroyed carriage surrounded by corpses is more likely to be the doing of bandits. Despite seeming a bit rough around the edges, Nords are a highly intuitive people and have many old traditions, some of which have survived for thousands of years. Nord nobility are said to have a psychic reading done for their children to discover omens that will be part of their life. Other superstitions include dark tales surrounding Skyrim's standing stones, of which many Nords believe great and terrible powers can be bestowed upon any who dare touch them. Nords in general are wary of anything involving magic, and their collective lack of understanding towards all things arcane often leads to tales such as this. I suppose if you're the kind of person who is afraid of the unknown, or at least apprehensive to complex things that you don't understand, and prefer to find strength in familiarity, then that's another reason you may be most like a Nord.
God. Unlike some of the other races of Tamriel, who have pantheons filled with dull but benevolent Aedra who simply claim to help faithful mortals, the Nords literally have a god that is prophesized to eat the entire world, Alduin. If you are comfortable holding somewhat grim and fated beliefs, then that's another reason you could be a Nord. And now we come to the Orcs. I know I've talked about some beast races such as Khajiit and Argonians being viewed as outsiders by people in other provinces, however Orcs truly take the outcast cake today as they've never had a true province like the other races do. At least an Argonian can sit in the marshes with his tribe, knowing that in all directions for miles there are almost exclusively other Argonians, and in general they can travel far and wide before experiencing some kind of prejudice. The name for Orcs, Orsma, literally means pariah folk, and this is what the Orcs have always found themselves to be. So if you're the kind of person who struggles to fit in anywhere you go, and perhaps has never felt like you've had a stable place to call home, then maybe you'd feel like you belong in one of the many scattered Orcish strongholds. Sure, there has been a kingdom known as Orsinium built, where Orcs have come to gather from far and wide, but it has fallen many times throughout history, and even moved location on multiple occasions. It seems like no matter how hard the Orcs try to have a place of their own, even their largest efforts are disrupted. Orc strongholds can be found in many provinces of Tamriel, and while there is definitely nuance between different tribes and their beliefs, stronghold orcs share the fact that they live in a traditional culture where might is right. There is a clear hierarchical structure, and when it comes to mating, the winner takes all. So if sex isn't that important to you personally, well there's a good chance you won't be having it as a male. Orc society is polygamous, however it is the chieftain of the tribe who has mating privileges with all of the women. No other male of the stronghold is allowed to father children or even have a wife. In order to prevent familial mixing, Orc chieftain daughters are traded for those of other strongholds. In many ways it is a tough life, leading some Orcs to abandon their culture entirely and travel into provinces such as Cyrodiil to live a more cosmopolitan existence in one of the many cities. But for those Orcs who stay, the only way you'll end up with wives of your own is to become the chieftain by one day replacing him as the bravest and strongest. But all of this is not done without purpose, it is done to keep the tribe strong. Only those worthy enough can become the leader and pass on their genes. It is strange to think how this lifestyle could be reflected in anyone watching the video, but I suppose one could relate if they see recreational sexual relations as unnecessary to a meaningful life. As a female, you might be traded with another tribe and sent away to marry a chief you've never met. Female orcs are also tasked with much of the blacksmithing and their crafting is deeply respected, so it would be best if you were someone who enjoys working a forge. Females can also act as bodyguards and hunters, so as an orc, it's not like you'll always be forced to stay at home. Coming back to your own beliefs, I'd say that if you admire or simply just believe that only those of strong mind and strong body, the types who would be willing to fight to the death for the right to lead, should lead in society, then you may also fit in as an orc. Another thing to consider is that orc stronghold culture is clearly not big on individuality, so you wouldn't want to be someone looking for much personal freedom in living there. Orcs do tend to be straightforward in their dealings and operate under a code attributed to Malakath known as the Code of Morlock. The code dictates the roles of the chief and his wife, as well as the role of the wise woman who presides over spiritual matters and is highly respected by all tribe members. Orcs must not steal, they must not murder their kin, and they should never attack without reason. Paying what is known as the blood price is the punishment for any crime. Jails are simply not an option. The victim, if they still live, gets to spill the blood of the wrongdoer until they are satisfied that punishment has been met. If the victims are dead, the surviving family members do the blood spilling. It's gruesome, but I'm sure it's an effective deterrent. An alternative to bleeding is paying the victim or their family in goods. If you're the kind of person who just hates all the complexities of the legal system and thinks jails are a waste of time, space, and labor, then perhaps you'd prefer to live under such rules as an orc. This harsh yet simple approach can even extend to disputes which can be settled in quick but brutal battles. And now we arrive at one of the most independent races of Tamriel, the Red Guards. If you've always felt the urge to be out on the road or on the deck of a ship, living a life full of adventure, then this could be the race most suited to you. The Red Guards of Hammerfell have a reputation for being the most skilled swordsmen in all of Tamriel, and take to battle as naturally as a Bosma shoots a bow. While Red Guards make great warriors, they are thought to fare better as skirmishers or scouts, or any other role that allows them to act independently and with freedom, as opposed to fighting in a organized group. Diligently working on their skill with a blade is only one part of what has earned Red Guards their reputation. The other component is their innate advantage when it comes to physical performance. 
the Red Guards have a lot of stamina, and this allows them to deliver a barrage of powerful attacks without tiring. They're known to be fast on their feet and can run for longer than most. Their physical blessings have been reflected across the Elder Scrolls games in different ways with their adrenaline rush power. In Skyrim, it grants them super fast stamina regeneration, and in Morrowind and Oblivion, it fortifies agility, endurance, speed, strength, and health. If you look in the mirror and think, that's what peak physical performance looks like, then perhaps you're quite similar to the Red Guards. This would be the race most similar to you if you're a highly conditioned athlete, good at sports, or you're a naturally skilled fighter and enjoy disciplined training. You'll also fit in well in Hammerfell if you're able to deal with all the hot weather. After all, Hammerfell is known for its scorching deserts. If you don't like sand because it's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere, then it probably isn't the place for you. Some Red Guards are also known for their intense ability to focus. The most revered Red Guards from history are the Sword Singers. They have mastered the ability through through intense amounts of discipline and meditative effort to summon a sword from their very own spirit. This does not sound like the kind of activity for someone who struggles to focus. However, if you're someone who can get themselves into a deep state of mindfulness, then perhaps you'd have a better chance than most at creating a spirit sword of your own. As far as cultural aesthetic preferences go, body piercings and tattoos are a common aesthetic choice. Red guards are also known to appreciate beards. There is a red guard proverb that states, a man is only as great as the beard that wears him. Let me know in the comments if you agree with that. Red guards are also quite opposed to magic and have a deep respect for the fallen. In fact, they find interfering with the cycle of life and death so appalling that they even have a distasteful view of those who strike down the undead, even if they're doing it to protect society society from necromancers and their victims. If you've always hated Halloween, horror movies, or simply agree that messing with the dead is never justified under any circumstances, then life in Hammerfell might be for you. Last but not least, we have the Bosma, the Wood Elves. These agile climbers and master marksmen live in harmony with nature in the most dense forests of Tamriel in the southern province known as Valen Wood. The Bosma appreciate the beauty of the forest and live the closest thing to a primal way of life out of all the playable Elder Scrolls races. Bosma are also stated to not only be quite fertile compared to other races of elves, but also more amorously inclined. So if you want to return to Monkey and let your libido run rampant in a beautiful forest while you chill in some beautiful tree city, then this is the race for you. It is a romantic way of living, though there is more to it than simply being a tree-hugging hippie. The Wood Elves are quite a spiritual people and live in accordance with a special agreement known as the Green Pact. Long ago, the Wood Elves were said to have been formless and part of the Ooze, constantly shifting into different states and unable to keep their shape. The forest god Ifri gave them form, though in return he said they must not ever change their form again, though in times of emergency for their race, they could take on a shape-shifting monstrous form by unleashing a power known as the Wild Hunt. In addition to not shifting forms, the Green Pact also required that the Wood Elves not harm any of the forest's vegetation. Due to this, the Bosma were to subsist entirely off of meat and animal products, so if you couldn't fathom sticking to a Joe Rogan carnivore diet, then being a Bosma definitely isn't for you. But if you love to eat meat and also love to walk around nature, then being a Bosma might just be your perfect life. You'd also have a better time in Valenwood if you actually enjoy hunting as part of your lifestyle, but also have respect for all of the life forms of the forest, including those you slay to eat. Bosma are resourceful people and tend not to waste any part of what they kill. They make tools and weapons from bone, and in earlier times, when they were more traditional, most would fast before a battle because they knew they must consume the flesh of the fallen. If you avoid as much waste as possible or love to repurpose things instead of throw them out, then you're probably off to a good start as a wood elf. Bosma men particularly are also of a smaller stature when compared to the other races of Tamriel. They are far shorter than high elves and all Bosma have a reputation for being highly nimble. If you're more of a lithe type with a slighter frame, then you would find traversing the trees of Valenwood a lot easier. But Wood Elves are not only agile with their body, but also their mind in the form of quick wit. Does that remind you of anyone? The Bosma are also incredibly skilled with a bow, having earned themselves a reputation as the best archers across all of Tamriel. I'm not sure how many of those listening have used a bow before, but if you talk naturally to it like some people I know, then that's one of the biggest indicators of them all that Valenwood is for you. 
So with all of that in mind, which Elder Scrolls race are you? Did one of the ten just pop out as obviously you, or do you think you're a mix between two or even three of the options? Let me know in the comments section below, and please do hit that like button if you found this video enjoyable. It's all starting to make me wonder what Elder Scrolls race the three of us here at Fudge Muppet would most suit. Thank you so much for tuning into Fudge Muppet. As always, social media links can be found in the description if you're interested in keeping up with our Elder Scrolls thoughts outside of YouTube, as well as a link to our Patreon and merch store if you want to help support the channel and look good while doing it. Thanks again for watching, my name is Michael, and I look forward to nerding out with you again very soon.